Good. So, um, oops. great. So I'm Mary Catherine. I'm uh, on staff here with CWS and work with Connie Anderson, who most of you get emails and things from. She's our lead uh, community engagement person for all of our monthly partners. And Connie and I um, had heard Rick um, talk a little bit about his recent trip to Moldova, where he saw the work that CWS has been able to do to welcome Ukrainian refugees and to support the Moldovans who are welcoming them. And um, as we were talking about that, we thought, oh, this this would be great for our monthly partners to have the opportunity to hear um, about Rick's trip and just talk with him. All of you are um, so important to us. Your ongoing support makes uh, a tremendous difference in, in our ability to do um, our mission. And so I am so excited that Rick said, of course. And so this is the time for you to um, to hear from him, but also just to, to talk with him. And uh, you can ask him questions about um, his trip, but or just anything in general, since um, each of you brings a certain um, mission connection and passion to why you're a part of CWS. So if there's anything that you want to ask him about, yeah, you're welcome to, to throw that out at him. So at this point, I'll just turn it over to you, Rick. And um, Oh, yeah. And you can also, if you want to write a question as he's talking, you can write it into the chat and we'll go through those. Um, or if you want to stop him along the way, you can raise your hand and he can, uh, we'll, we'll try to get that over to, to him right away. So without that, I'll let you go, Rick. Great. Thanks, Mary Catherine. And and thanks to, to Heather and to Connie for, for helping organize. Uh, it's a it's a pleasure to, to to be able to share with you some of my reflections and thoughts and observations from the trip I took to Moldova. Um, so maybe I'll start. Um, you know, every day still in the news, we're we're listening to and seeing um, just the the horrific scenes of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, and whether even though we hear about things like the pullouts, so with, with good news, it's always wrapped in bad news, which is. You hear about the the the, cha the torture chambers, the the destruction um, that that's going on inside these places that are occupied, um, and truly, this is I would say in in so many ways this is uh, such a is for Europe at least probably the 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 worst clearly the worst since World War II um, in terms of movement of people in terms of uh, destabilization of the security system um, the European does have kind of lived under since World War II. And really, just just a frankly, um, just a horrible, a horrible uh, situation. Um, I was really uh, so. So maybe I'll start with one. We looked at as Church World Service. We looked at uh, a response to the war back when it started last January, um, and we sent a team out to do an assessment. Um, what was really interesting and 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 very fortunate in many ways, and then uh, and I can tell you that there's a unfortunate in a few a few others. Um, and I'll get to that at the end. But we went and looked at the response. We're very lucky to be part of something called the International Act Alliance, which is World Council of Churches and churches that act together. That's what ACT stands for, um, Action of Churches Together. And, and just we looked at across the board who was responding, where they were responding, and where would it make sense for us to respond as an organization. And what we found was, in some ways, this 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 response has been the most well-funded emergency response refugee situation that we've seen in a in a very very long time. So what that meant was governments like the government of Poland, the government of Czechoslovakia, the government of um, uh, the Czech sorry the Czech Republic, um, and and Hungary and um, uh, Romania. Uh, which were all parts of the European Union and all parts of NATO, um, really put concerted effort and that the rest of Europe really leaned into this response. That included other international organizations. So as we were looking at all that was being done, and, and, and there's tremendous need both inside Ukraine and outside, um, we decided to focus in on Moldova. And so, uh, so many, maybe some of you have never heard of Moldova. It's one of the smallest countries in Europe. It's one of the very poorest countries, and it's also um, not a part of NATO and not a part of EU. So, so in terms of local, the local context, it was there are also people there who are very vulnerable, and um, there's a lot of Russian speakers in Moldova. The the main language of Moldova is Romanian. 
um, and it's it's the Moldova sandwich on the map between Romania and and Ukraine. So we decided that that's where we wanted to focus our response, mostly because none of our other partners, uh, in terms of the alliance and other places, were focusing on on Moldova. But secondly, it really was a vulnerable country in and of itself, let alone hosting many refugees. One of the interesting uh, facts of, of of that of that situation is that, in fact, per capita. Um, Moldova hosts more refugees than any other countries, even though it's the poorest um, in the region. It, it, so total number, it, it isn't the most, but the most per capita for its population, which is around one and a half to two million people. So as we went there and we did our assessment, what we saw was a lot of people were, were using Moldova as a transit point. So they were transiting through the country to Romania. We also saw it as a place where a lot of people decided to stay. And also because of the Russian that's spoken there, uh, the Russian speaking parts of the Ukrainians who were fleeing felt very comfortable where if they went to Romania or some of these other countries, there, there's not much Russian spoken. So, so the, the comfort level, the, the relative closeness to where they lived, um, as well as just really the hospitality of, of, of the Moldovans to people coming across the border. I always find it amazing, frankly, that the people with the least are sometimes the, the welcoming of the most. And so they've just tremendously opened their arms, opened their homes, um, and the government has tried to put um, create um, what they call RACs, RACs, or reception centers, um, refugee uh, assistance centers, they're called. And so as we looked at all the different things that was going on, we had established partners in Moldova also previously. And so we sent uh, Steve Weaver, who was our regional director for the Middle East and Europe, to uh, there and, and to do with some other emergency response folks and to do an assessment. And essentially, we identified three areas of, of, of real concern, um, or, or actually four areas. So, so one is um, food, that when people are coming over the border, that they, they leave a lot. They basically leave with almost nothing. You know, we, we've been doing this campaign about putting things in a bag um, and when, when refugees flee, and frankly, that's for the most part what they did. Um, so food, food items, um, we non-food items, mostly that's been around hygiene. Um, so uh, feminine hygiene, um, just hygiene around, you know, just things like toothbrush, soap, toothpaste, and other hygiene related items. Um, the third um, was around blankets and warm clothing, because when I went there in September, it was already cold. Um, it was definitely colder than it was here. Uh, and so that was the third area. And then the fourth area, we really wanted to look at the issues of protection. So, so when 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 a when a young child or when a woman with a young child or just a woman crosses the border, um, in any situation like this, oftentimes there's there are dangers around trafficking and other other kind of abusive situations. So, we wanted to try to see how we could be supportive of quote unquote protection, legal protection and support protection, meaning when they come across, make sure they can find either uh, a rack that they could go to the RAC or they could find a home or just just trying to be like an, provide services um, as well as we could. So those were the four areas of, of support um, that we had identified. And frankly, those are still, um, we, we find that, that the need for those four are still very high. Um, and 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 the, the good news when I was there was that it was even though it was starting to get cold, um, most people I think felt um, comfortable um, in terms of where they were staying and and who they're staying with. Um, but it was really clear that 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 um, that uh, that w winter was on its way already, and that 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 winter would bring more refugees. And as we've seen the destruction recently, when Russia loses territory, it sends in drone strikes and ruins infrastructure, which makes it harder to live. So there was this sense that the numbers of, of people coming into Moldova would significantly increase. So the other thing I wanted to say about Moldova and, and our approach to this project, uh, maybe there's two other things I want to say. One is 
we decided also because Moldova is such a poor place itself that we our response couldn't be just focused only on refugees that we actually had to help the host communities and host families so oh. some of the support that we've talked about we are also support pro, uh, providing for for some of the host communities and also i'll just give you an example there's a place uh, one of the racs uh in and the the district called soroko which is one of the northern districts it's right on the border with ukraine um, there was a summer camp there and the government um, and, and the camp was made available to refugee families to live there. So there's about 15 to 20 families there. Um, we had actually we we create we did two things for that 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 facility. We brought in more industrial kitchen wear and work. And so they were able to cook and feed feed the families that had come. And then we we added a solar panel and heating system. Um, so it would provide heat and hot water for 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 the, the 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 refugees who were there. But frankly, when the when the re refugees eventually go, that camp, which which I was told and by the director that you know people from all over Moldova and other parts of Eastern Europe come to visit it during the summertime, those that facility will be there, and that the stuff that we we provided will be there. Um, in the long haul for those for people to use it um, and Moldovans to use it in the future. The only other thing I, I really maybe want to say uh, during our, our time together is that, you know, I'm 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 really proud of of a couple of things about this program. Um, for for CWS, I, I think there's a there's a a formula and a good way a dynamic formula that we use when we respond to emergencies, and one of them is good good. Um, uh, technical support or technical approach. So for us, those four areas is the technical approach, food, non-food, uh, warm, uh, warm clothing and bedding, and then um, protection. And so in, in this case, all of those were, were highly relevant, really important, and are making a difference in having an impact on people's lives. The second thing for me in an emergency response like this is local partners. So we are really proud to, to really uh, approach programs with a local first approach. So what that means is we try to work with all the local infrastructure organizations and, and uh, programs there. Uh, really proud to be working with a group called Diakonia who received uh, this year our ecumenical award. Diakonia is a, a program, uh, it's a Moldovan organization, but it's related to the Romanian Orthodox Church. And they are just a fantastic group and really, um, uh, really, really um, doing a lot of really good work. And in fact, actually, when we when we first went there, they were being approached by about 20 different organizations. And then they asked us a couple of simple questions. They knew us already and they just said, how are you gonna work? And, and essentially they chose us to be their partner as much as we chose them. So, so really, really happy with the, the, the local partnerships. So, the, so my three things are technical intervention, local partners. And then the, the third piece to that is, is good local staff teams. So I'm really proud of the team that we've built there. Um, we have, it's, it's a combination of, of expats. So we have a couple of former Peace Corps volunteers who speak the language, who are working on that team, as well as local um, Moldovans. Um, we have a really top-notch uh, staff team there. And really just, just when I when I saw that in action, I got to see probably 10 different things. When I was there, we, we saw a distribution center. Um, we, we met with a lot of um, Moldovan and uh, Ukrainian families. Um, we went to see one of the, a couple of the RACs there. Um, we also met with some partners that did cycle social support and other types of support. So I got to see different parts of the country, different types of interventions, meet the local partners, um, and um, really just was was super, I came away from that saying, just I'm so proud of the work that Church World Service is doing. Um, and, you know, we we want to do more. Um, and we're looking for more of kind of always looking for more resources to do more. Uh, maybe the final thing I want to say is that we've been really fortunate. This response has been funded by, by uh, in large part, by our member churches. So whether uh, the, the United Methodists have really been just super supportive um, and the, the Evangelical Lutheran Church, um, uh, the Church of the Brethren, um, and the American Baptists, 
um, and the United Church of Christ, just to name a few, um, just have been super, they really came together and said, tell us what you need. And we're going to, we're going to do as much as we can to be supportive. So, so really proud of that. And then also the donations from people like you and our, our networks, we, we, we had an incredible response um, to um, the, the, the crisis and, um, you know, these types of crises, um, even even in the best of times, when whether even if it's a natural disaster where the crisis happens in a very short period of time, and then we we do the rebuilding, there's always a a a um, a continuum of of support that we do. So there's the immediate initial response, and oftentimes that gets the most um, visibility on TV and in the news. And people say, "Oh, are you giving 100% of my dollars to this response at this moment in this second? And but frankly, that's only in some ways the tip of the iceberg of the response, because oftentimes in these situations, the, the the longer term rebuilding and recovery needs to happen as well. And you in any uh, you know six months or a year into it, when you're not on the news, people say, "Oh, that 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 emergency's passed." When in fact, actually, the longer term commitment is when again part of what we do at Church World Services is during that time when after the the, the initial um, emergency. Unfortunately for us in Ukraine right now, this is a long-term emergency, and we're going to be seeing it in the news probably at least for the next year. Um, and then when, when, if, if, and when the Russians decide to do the right thing and and pull out or, or stop this war, or negotiate whatever a, a, a fair and just settlement for the Ukrainians on Ukrainian terms, hopefully, um, we're talking about a, a decade of of rebuilding. Just to share with you my experience from, um, as many of you, you know, I was um, I was in the Haiti earthquake in 2010, and um, uh, we, uh, as my the organization I was with at the time, uh, made a, made a, a commitment to to rebuild Haiti, and and frankly, uh, even though there's a lot of um, it's in the news now for a lot of unpleasant reasons, the rebuilding that happened after the earthquake really took about a decade. And so I see I see Ukraine easily being in that if whenever the 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 the, the firing in the in, in the in the war actually ends, the ability for Ukraine to rebuild that's going to that's going to be a easily a decade long uh, 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 project. And so hopefully we can walk with them um, as we move forward. So. Maybe I'll stop there. That's a lot of information and me talking really fast, uh, which is what I, I usually do when I've got, I'm excited about uh, the topic and really want to share as much as I can. But I uh, just wanted to say thank you, um, how grateful I am and how grateful Church World Service is for your support and all the different ways that you support us. And uh, and, and thank you for, for, for being on this call today. Yeah, Betty, you have a question? Oh, you're on mute, Betty. Betty, you're uh, you're on mute. Betty, you have to. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> Sorry to waste your time. <laughs> it's just good to see you again, Rick. Welcome back, and I'm thrilled with what you're doing. Uh, I, I particularly love the communication. So uh, are you saying then that you're kind of taking your cues from Diaconia, which I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that they're your partners. And what, um, uh, can you give us a little bit more information? Your on-site team is composed of how many people? Yeah. And, and um, well, can you give us, I know the solar thing, that sounds great. Did you, are you using kits or what, you know, just a little bit more detail? Yeah, you bet. So, so uh, Diakonia is one of probably um, a half a dozen partners that we're working with in, in, okay. um, in Moldova. And in fact, uh, we're doing some very specific interventions with them um, around, around uh, basically ch child support and protection. So we actually, okay. 
we were supporting they, they built a a small center and then we actually put on a that. To that yeah so so helping the basically around the children's child support psychosocial mm -hmm. support and then okay. also giving them the tools to the kids were actually when i was there they were in class with a teacher in ukraine right so so really supporting that some of the other stuff that we're doing um we're, we're doing a little bit with the government of moldova around the racs um, mm -hmm. And then we're all, um, and then in terms of the, um, uh, I, I've forgotten the name of the local partner, but we're working with another local partner doing the distribution center in Balti, which is in the center of the country. Okay. So, so a lot of the interventions are <laughs> are are being driven by um, by us in in partnership with our local the local partners. Um, the the other thing is in terms of the staff, we have a still a very small footprint there. We probably have mm -hmm. three or four people. Um, uh, uh, two wonder. of them are expats. Two of them are local. Um, and then the two the two expats are are, are both um, former Peace Corps volunteers. Oh, mm. yeah. okay. Who were posted in Moldova. So really, yeah. it's very fortunate to have people who really yeah. know the context. Yeah. Um, Thank Bob? you. Bob, do you have a question? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I, Couple things. One, just wondering. It uh, sounds like you're pretty well funded. Just wondering, are crop walk funds going to be used at all uh, in this effort? I would say we, at this point we're 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 funded. Um, I think the reality is the the need still far outstrips our 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 resources. So the more funding we could get, the more we would we mm -hmm. put into that. Um, yes, so the parts of crop walk funding is going in there. there the, we're, we're coordinating different pools. We're bringing certain funding. Some of our church donors are, are, are definitely supporting us. So it's it's uh, it's definitely going to the work in Ukraine or, okay. yeah, or Ukraine. I, I ask that because I do get that question from uh, some of our walkers, Absolutely. recruiters yeah. or team captains. The other other thing is just more of a kind of a comment, and I'm delighted to hear that you know there's such a strong response. Uh, to uh, Ukraine and, and and their needs and so forth. Uh, the only thing that troubles me is that uh, uh, I think it's because of they're they're European. They're they look like us and uh, too many other places where uh, they're not European. Uh, the, the response is not uh, near so strong, and so it, that's just a disappointment that I have in in uh, uh, people, I guess. So Bob, I share that with you. I share that disappointment. I think I think of what happened in Syria, and just the, the the number of people coming. Right now, we have a lot of people coming from Venezuela, and 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 they're being treated as props for election, you, you know, <laughs> uh, things cycle in this election cycle. So, I'm just really, um, uh, you know, I, I w one of the things we're trying to do is also use this opportunity to say. You know, there are other emergencies in the world. Um, there are other refugee situations in the world um, and really try to communicate out what those are. And then and then, frankly, you know, this this situation has created both. Uh, there's so many different things around climate change. There's the, the COP meeting in Egypt right now. There's the, 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 there's a, a real true threat that there would be not enough food in the world because the grain was being held hostage by the war. Luckily, that that seems to at least for now be um, be sorted out. Um, and so, so there are other there's you know there's still famine in in Africa there, and and because of climate change and other things. And then, you know, just the the food prices and for us it's we see it in terms of food prices. For the rest of the world they see it in food availability. So it's a it's a huge it's a there, there's a lot of things related to this i think that don't get the attention that, that 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 they need and and hopefully we're trying to communicate all of that um but it's a lot of messages for people but but i'm i appreciate again the support and if we can translate that into new refugee support or re support for refugees in other parts of the world all the better and, and frankly there's not enough resources nearly enough for for those responses right right okay oh, thank, thanks rick appreciate that thanks, Bob. yeah so Rick, that, that's a good segue into a question that Peggy had um, around the Afghan Adjustment Act. And mm -hmm. if you have, um, I know that Churchill Service has been very much in, called for that and applauded that it was um, uh, put forth. But do you have any thoughts around the prospects of that um, passing or suggestions for advocacy or any any thoughts about um, our work to support yeah. Afghans? Yeah, so so you know that's a great question. So so maybe I, I would say one of the things that I was that was heartening for me this year, um, with 
um, both the situation with the Afghanistan, with the, the, the essentially the collapse of the country and the government, and then the rush to, to, to leave, um, and then bringing into the U.S. over basically 70, over 75,000 Afghans. Um, but by the way, Churchill's service resettled or was a part of resettling over 8,000. So really feel we played a really big part. But the interesting thing about that moment was um, it could have... We, it could have reflected some of the narrative from the previous administration that basically said people who come into this country are bad and they do bad things and we need to get rid of them. But in fact, the opposite happened. The mil people in the military, people um, who would who perhaps supported other parts of that agenda did not support that agenda um, in terms of Afghans. So there's there's across the board bipartisan support like there had been historically for them, for Afghans coming into the country, which was great. Um, the the, uh, the Afghan Adjustment Act, uh, my understanding is that we're talking about um, the, the idea of humanitarian parole and how do we simplify that. So, so as you know, when people come across the southern border and they come as asylees, then they're, they're essentially paroled and then they're, they're, they go into this uh, backlog of, of cases that need to be adjusted, adjudicated. And then what 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 the government did was in order to bring those Afghans in so quickly, they basically created they gave them, quote unquote, the humanitarian parole. And so both in terms of that, that that actually dampened their ability to get support like other refugees did, but it allowed them to come into the country quickly. So the first kind of set of adjustments was allowing them to have the support that needed to be done. Um, for for all refugees, so we could put them into the the more normal channels of support. Um, but then, secondly, we're really trying to get uh, build uh, change um, the law so that people their their parole um, uh, their ability to be uh, on parole and have to wait a really long time. I think the backlog is almost three, four, maybe even five years. So it's a truly a, a tremendously uh, uh, not a great situation. And so. Um, yeah, so I would say, you know, anything, I would say the two issues for us are, are the, the, you know, reducing that, that backlog on the humanitarian parole or setting up a way that they can do that more easily, and then supporting, continuing to support benefits as if they were refugees, um, and not coming in, quote unquote, on, on humanitarian parole. I hope that answered the question. I, I conflated probably about three different issues. Yeah. But they're all moving almost, I think, believe in the same direction. Yeah, uh, can I just ask a follow-up? Yeah, yeah. My concern is that the Afghans that many of us worked so hard with last year have now finished, for many of them, the first year of their two-year humanitarian parole. So they are, uh, the clock is ticking. Yeah. And I was wondering whether you think that after the midterms are over and settled down, whether the administration will pick this back up again and whether it has a chance of a bipartisan passage because otherwise, aren't we facing a, a, dis, a terrible public relations disaster for us all when 75,000 people are suddenly without status? Disenfranchised. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I'm absolutely convinced the administration has will will um, will try to extend that and put a lot of energy behind it. I think it it was it's always been a bipartisan issue, and and frankly, the military supports this, so I think that will really help um, move it forward. Um, uh, I, you know, the, the big thing, one of the big things for us at Church World Service around refugee and refugee resettlement is that the pipeline of refugees coming into the country was at its lowest in probably <coughs> years, 60 years. And yeah. so one of the things the administration has really made a commitment on is, is rebuilding that pipeline. So, I, so, and they've, frankly, I, I'm, the, the, I would say the first year Biden was a little bit wishy-washy on it. Um, and we were, and we pushed. I think the community, including Churchill Service, our faith community, we we sent letters and 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 got uh, some of our our faith partners involved, and we were able to, I think, uh, get them to do the right thing, which is to increase the number of refugees and to rebuild the pipeline. And and frankly, that that is definitely in process. So. I feel the administration recently has been really good on these issues, and I think that even, even I, with now that this then it seems to be still democratic, I, I still see I'm really hopeful um, that we'll get that legislation passed. Thanks. And if I could give a, a little shout out, I put in the in the chat. We do have um, if you go to the C Davis website and you go to take action, the first one is something like Speak Out Alert. 
but you can sign up to get regular alerts on different advocacy actions that you can take to help support both this but other um, other issues that Churchill Services is working towards. So um, it'll tell you what to say, who to call, who to text, that kind of thing. So um, if you haven't signed up for those seek out alerts, they're a great way to stay up to date on on advocacy opportunities. Are there any other, we're, we're at our half hour, um, but this is your time. So if anybody, uh, if, if if anybody else has any other questions or comments or anything else for Rick, maybe we can take one more if there is any. Okay, good, good. Well, um, we are so grateful for all of you. Um, I know Connie tries to love on all of you as much as she can with <laughs> birthday cards and emails and messages, but um, you know, all the work that we do, you, you form that, that foundation. When an emergency strikes, we can't say, wait till we go raise the money to help you. We have to be able to help right away and then backfill. And, and many of you who are monthly partners, you're part of that, um, that, immediate, that immediate response. So thank you. Um, if there's anything you need, we're here for you. Um, you are uh, CWS, so uh, just reach out to Connie, to me, to Rick, um, and let us know if you have other questions or, or if you need anything. Great. Thank you. Hey, Kevin. Thanks, everyone. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. <laughs>